Welcome to episode 54 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs and NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lepore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lepore, I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. If you're a new listener and you enjoy the show, it would be a big time help if you give us a five-star rating and review on both Apple and Spotify. And if you're watching us on YouTube and you enjoy the content, We would appreciate it so, so much if you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. All right, everybody. As of Wednesday, March 9th, 2022, the Toronto Maple Leafs have been an absolute roller coaster ride. I mean, it is unbelievable. If they don't score five goals a night, They're probably not winning these days. The goaltending has been a complete disaster. Austin Matthews is on fire. Lepore and I are going to get into everything that went down with the Leafs over the past week. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So stay tuned until the very end. And right now, it is time to welcome in my partner in crime, Mr. Michael Lepore. How you doing, man? As always, Anthony Bruno, doing well. Excited to record a pod. And as you've said, things in Leafland have been absolutely bananas. So it should be a good one. Episode number 54. Uh, There's been a few times where I've made jokes about uh, a certain number in the history of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And this one's no exception. In the history of the original six team, the Toronto Maple Leafs, only two players have worn number 54. One of them, Chris Newbery, if you remember him. And the second one, fan favorite for one year, the GOAT, Frederick Goche, who won a Calder Cup with the Marlies, had a really good junior career, was a first-round pick, and as it stands right now, is in the New Jersey Devils system playing for the Utica Comets. Oh, my goodness. And wasn't Newberry like an unreal junior player? Yeah, aren't they all? I could have sworn (laughs) I looked up his junior stats one time, and he he had like 100 points or something like that. Sure. But yeah, man, Freddie Goche, God, first round pick. Mm. Thought he was going to be that big six foot four centerman, can play both ways, can defend. Oh God, yeah. that that he didn't did really not work out. He didn't really use his size. I think Goche is one of those uh, players who fell victim just to sort of league timing. Had it been 10, 15 years earlier, he would have been completely sought after, been a, a stud. Would have been able to like battle in front, be that big guy. But now it's just so much about foot speed and skill and actual talent with the puck that those guys aren't suitable anymore. Like even too, it hasn't been that long. And you think about even just like the body and style of that player. He was a first round pick. No. Oh, it's insane. Nowadays, yeah. there's no chance that there's no one in the first round. No way. No way. Just not good enough of an athlete. I'll put it that way. But anyone, anyways, uh, everyone loved the goat. He had a great personality. He was a funny guy. I've seen some interviews for him. And as I said, he's playing in Utica right now. And uh, hopefully he gets another shot in the show. Or you may, I could see him in Europe or something like that, too. We hope you're doing well, Freddie Goche. Well, yeah, wherever you are. If by miracle, you're actually listening to the Gluttons for Punishment podcast. Yeah. All right, Lapore, let's get right into the show. So just a brief overview of what happened since our last podcast. The Leafs, coming off that embarrassing 5-1 loss of the Buffalo Sabres, lost again to the Vancouver Canucks on home ice, falling 6-4. But John Tavares um, came into the game on a 14-game goal drought and actually scored a goal. So that was uh, pretty exciting to see. (laughs) Napping that just painful goal drought. Glorious. Um, but yeah, then the Leafs followed up that game with a, like I said, off the top of the show, it's been an absolute roller coaster ride. They beat the Columbus Blue Jackets five to four. They jumped out to a three nothing lead after the first period. Then the Jackets scored three unanswered goals to tie it three three before the Leafs ended up winning five to four. Crazy. And then Tuesday night, March 8th, at home against the Seattle Kraken. 
The Leafs win six to four. They blew a three, one lead. The Kraken scored three straight to go up four, three before the Leafs scored three unanswered goals to win six to four. I mean, it's just been insane. Lapore, give me your thoughts on what we've seen from this team specifically over these last three games. Yeah, Bruno, you're uh, you're giving me a headache <laughs> going over these games, but this is how I'll describe it. So I'm as big of a Leaf fan as anybody. I love the blue and white. I love this team. And I haven't said that many times throughout my life as a Maple Leafs fan. I am not kidding when I say this. I am not kidding. Both times they had the lead against uh, Columbus and Seattle. I was thinking, you know what? I should live bet Columbus or Seattle right now. When it was 3 nothing. The color co- the the commentators on the game were like, "Oh, the Leafs are cruising, dominating, causing turnover," and they were. But I think I speak for all Leafs fans when I say I was not confident at all. And moving on to the Seattle game, it was more of the same. You're just waiting for the team to allow a few goals. And to be fair, it's getting kind of boring. I mean, there's always a lot to, a lot to talk about when it comes to the Toronto Maple Leafs, but. It's kind of the same old story now. Like you said, they're letting in a lot of goals. They're scoring their way out of problems. The goaltending thing that's not, at one point, we were just saying the goaltending, ah, it's adjusting, it's fine. But it keeps moving along as poor and poor and poor and poor. So I don't know what to make of what to be worried about, really, and how to make a ranking. And I'm sure we can do that throughout the show. But it's getting just kind of lull because you go into every game expecting this almost kind of like the Randy Carlisle days when the team could score, but they'd also give up a lot of goals. I just, I just hope there are some solutions. I'll, I'll talk as a fan now. And I think there are, and again, we'll go, we'll go over them and the reason why they're playing this way. But uh, how, uh, how freaked out are you? Are you, was your stomach in knots during these games? I'm very concerned right now, Laporte. And you know me, I'm a very rational thinker. I don't get, you know, too out of control when I see something happen, you know, whether it's one game or a three game stretch or a week stretch, I'm not going to get out of control and say, you know, the world is crashing down, but based on how the goaltending has performed since the beginning of December and how it just continues to, to get worse, really, I mean, it's not getting any better. It's, it's, it's been really bad. Like I'll go over the numbers again and we go over the numbers on every podcast. Yeah. Trust me. They're going over it every day on TSN and Sportsnet. It's just, it's brutal. Since December 1st, the Leafs rank 31st in the NHL in five on five save percentage at 890. Crazy. And overall save percentage, they rank 29th in the NHL since December 1st at 885. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is over 30 plus games. This isn't a, you know, a week stretch, a two week stretch. We can say, ah, don't worry about it. It's all good. They're just going to flip the switch in the playoffs. I would like to think this team can flip the switch in the playoffs, but I think that applies more to when you look at the team offensively and defensively being able to flip the switch. I don't think these goalies, the way that they've been playing, specifically over the last two to three months, are just going to flip the switch come playoff time. And that's what I'm concerned about. Because if it was more of a defensive issue, and again, they are having problems defensively. It's not like this team has been unbelievable defensively. They were very good defensively the first couple months of the season, and that's fallen off a little bit. You know, it's not a matter of, of, of flipping the switch in that regard or you know, maybe the, the core four not performing well. And it's like, ah, you know, if Matthews, Marner, Tavares, and Nylander weren't performing particularly well, you think, oh, come playoff time or come the home stretch of the season, these guys can turn it on. That's not the issue. It's this goaltending issue. Mm-hmm. Like, and there's no answer unless they go and make a trade, something that we discussed on the last podcast. So, Lapore, right now, man, I'm still very concerned because they're not going to have a chance in hell come playoff time if they're going to have to score five or six goals to win a game, it's just not going to happen, especially against either Florida or Tampa or Boston, whoever they end up playing in the first round. Yeah. I think to me, and I, one of those ones where I'd love to talk to actual hockey people about this, 
because the number the numbers are terrible. The numbers are absolutely gross. I saw one thing with Campbell. It was something like over his last 15 games, the number of four or five, uh, four or five goals against games he's had is like historically bad. It's like it hasn't been done since like the 90s or something. But where the discussion comes in for me anyway is is it a goaltending issue or a sort of like overall defense issue? And when I say defense, I mean the forwards, the D and the goalie. Cause at the end of the day, it's never about one thing. And we talked about this on the show before, where if you watch every individual game, the goalies themselves, for the most part, there's, there are, there have been ones, but for the most part, the goalies don't look overly bad. It's not like, like, like last night, like there was a tip goal, there was the shorthanded one cross crease, like maybe the first one Campbell could have had if he was sl- slow across the net. But for the most part, those goals, like the other one was just a rebound in front of the net. Like, like what are you going to say? Like there was the one two the other day like against Mraz, like every single one was tipped or that one when Marner lost his stick, kicked it right to the guy, shoots it in. So I think it's more of a collective thing than a goaltending thing. But where that affects the goalies is in their brain, none of that matters. And because it's the Toronto Maple Leafs, no one shuts the fuck up about it. So they're constantly being told every day that they're not playing well, even though it's a collective issue. I think something that's not getting enough attention, and this can stir up a discussion for sure, and comment down below what you think about this one. I think sometimes some people sort of don't give enough credit to a bad thing that's happened to a team and how much it affects them. And sometimes in hockey, because it's a sport where you roll lines, something, I don't want to say small, but something can happen that has a dramatic, a dramatic effect. And what I'm getting at is the Muzzin injury, okay? It's like, here you have this guy who averages 21 plus minutes a game. So here's a player who's on for more than a third of the game, okay? He brings something that our defense, that no other defender we have brings. And because of his injury, it's putting guys in a place that they don't really deserve to be. So I I think that's a, that's a big thing. It has to be worth something when a guy who is steady, solid, tough and plays one third of the game is not there. It it, it has to be given credit. It has to be given credit. Now I'm not saying it's all because of the Muzzin injury. I think there's a few other factors too. Like, Again, call me a fanboy all you want, but this team was the best team in the league for what, like three straight months? They were the number one ranked team in the league. They were due for a lull. Call it boredom, call it whatever. They were due for a lull. And Jack Campbell, as I said earlier, I consider myself to be the biggest of uh, Leafs fans in the world. Can any of us really look in the mirror and say that even when he was playing his best deep down, we really and truly believe that Jack Campbell was a high-end starting goalie in the National Hockey League. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, I, I thought in the back of my mind that he was bad or even say average. I think if we're all being honest with ourselves, we all thought Jack was a nice goalie. Goaltending's changed now because it's so robotic, like 60 to 70% of goalies, to me anyway, kind of fall in the same category of, yeah, they're fine. And on certain nights, they can be good. On certain nights, they can be bad. But as long as they give you like the 915, 918 save percentage, whatever. It's almost like to... the running back position in the end. Exactly. Exactly. So I just think a lot of it is it adjusting. Like his numbers didn't make sense. Now they've come crashing down. And now I think they're, it's getting worse than it should because of uh, what's going on between the years of Jack. So To me, you combine the fact that this team was having a dominant run. They were due for a lull. Jack Campbell's coming down to reality. And when I say reality, I don't mean that he sucks. I just mean that he is who he is. And we all know that deep down, if we're being honest with ourselves. And the Muzzin injury. Here's what I will say. I do agree with you about the goaltending not looking as bad as the numbers would indicate. Especially over the last couple of games against Columbus. And Seattle, there were some weird deflections, pucks going in off guys, you know, like, you know, like that backdoor pass that Max Max Domi made in the Columbus game. What a pass. Like, how are you, like, as a goaltender, I don't care if you're Igor Shesterkin right now, the overwhelming favorite to win the Vesna trophy, like, you're not going to make that save. 
right? And you can blame the defense on that. Like, oh, how does that pass get through? It was a really nice play by Max Domi. But what I'm trying to say is I do agree, Lepore, that, you know, there have been certain games during this stretch, let's call it since the beginning of December, where the goaltending hasn't looked as egregious as the numbers do. Because, you know, going back to Jack Campbell for a second, over his last 22 games, he has an 889 save percentage and a 347 goals against. Like, that mm-hmm. is horrendous over his last 22 games. But again, there have been moments where it hasn't been the goaltending that you can blame. It's been more on the defense and breakdowns. Now, I, I still have goaltending number one on if you're going to make a list of, you know, what, what, what's the, what are you going to blame the most for what's happening right now? I still have goaltending number one, but... The defensive issues are also a problem. And you do bring up a good point with with Jake Muzzin because, listen, I've been talking about this all year, how Jake Muzzin has not really looked good this year. And I think that he's taken a step back from when he first joined the Toronto Maple Leafs. But saying all that, you do make a good point when this dude is out there for 20, 21 minutes a night and it's putting everyone in the spot that they should be playing in when you lose a guy like that, that's extremely detrimental because just look at the defense core, for example, against Seattle in the last game, you had Riley and Lilligren on the top pair. Yeah. Brody and hall on the second pair and then Dermot and Labushkin on the bottom pair losing Jake Muzzin just puts all of that into a blender. Fucks it all up. And, yeah. and it's affected Morgan Riley because now Morgan Riley hasn't had the opportunity to play with TJ Brody, mm. who he's been phenomenal with over the last two seasons. So losing a guy like Jake Muzzin, you know, despite not having a great year, despite taking a step back, both offensively and defensively for that matter, it still has a big effect on a team like the Leafs that isn't that deep defensively because... You know, you can talk about Sandine, and even Sandine's out of the lineup too. But you can talk about Sandine and Lilligren all you want and how they're like the two young studs that are working their way to becoming, you know, top four defensemen in the NHL. But really, when you look at the Leafs defense core on paper, it's not that good compared to some of the other, you know, excellent or very good defensive teams in the National Hockey League. So you lose a guy like Jake Muzzin and it just puts that whole decor in a blender and you comp- compound that with the terrible goaltending. It's just not going to be pretty, man. And what you yeah. hope is that over these last, you know, 25 to 30 games, whatever they have left, you hope that guys get healthy. You hope that the goaltending figures it out. But I'm still, I'm still concerned because I don't have a lot of faith in Jack Campbell. I have no faith in Peter Barazic. He's been a disaster. So mm. unless Jack Campbell figures this out, I don't know. I, I don't know if the Leafs can, can outscore a Tampa or a Florida. Like, I mean, I, the Leafs can outscore any team. It can't be your plan. <laughs> but that can't be your plan going into a series against Andre Vasilevsky, who's won back-to-back Stanley Cups. He's pretty much the best goalie in the world, you know, despite Shesterkin having the monster season he's having. You can't go into that series. And against the Tampa team, who is so potent defensively, they cover every inch of the 200 feet of the ice, okay? They are unbelievable on both sides of the puck. You cannot go into a series like that expecting to score five or six goals a night. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. One thing, again, we always try to be as logical as possible. We talked about it on the last show that we both agreed. There's no way this team does not make a move for a defenseman. And Dubis came out and said um, in an interview this week that, yeah, that is the focus. They, they want to add a defenseman. It also came out that it looks like, if I remember correctly, Muzzin will be back in around a month. Was that, was that the, yeah, the comment? Yeah, the thing with about- Muzzin is they don't really know when he's going to be back. Yeah, but I think some, some news came out yesterday where they did say, like, there is at least some sort of timeline now. But so that, that all being said, getting Muzzin back and making a move for – another top four defenseman that that's a lot. I think like that really and truly does change things. And it's kind of like how right now everything's on a slippery slope down with Muzzin being hurt, the lack of depth, it spews into the goaltending. Hopefully it can cause the opposite. 
So Muzzin comes back, they make an addition, things are going well, there's more confidence, and that spills into the goaltending. So they feel like that pressure is a little off and they're seeing shots better. And let's face it too, everyone's pointing to how the Leafs are getting beaten in front of the net. They're allowing too many tips or losing battles. Well, that's Jake Muzzin. That's a lot, a lot of that time it would have been Jake Muzzin chopping someone down in front of the net. And again, I'm not making excuses. I'm not saying that Muzzin having Muzzin back would solve all these problems. I just think it's, it's, it's a collective group of things that's causing this downfall. And I do, I, I don't see how they don't at least do their very best to fix it. It's time for a quick break for a word about Manscaped, the champions of below the waist grooming and our proud sponsors who have done it again with the launch of the brand new ultra premium collection. From trimming your hockey pucks to your everyday grooming and hygiene routine, Manscaped is here. After lighting the lamp, hit the showers with this all-in-one skin and hair care kit that covers you from head to toe. Manscaped is trust below the waist, and now it's time to trust them with the rest. Join the 4 million men worldwide who use Manscaped by going to manscaped.com for 20% off and free shipping with the promo code GFP20. Lapore, these products are the best. They are the best, Anthony Bruno. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are hockey players, and we all spend time in the locker room. Nobody wants to look like an ape, guys, in the locker room. So get that lawnmower 4.0, take it to your body, finish it up with the shampoo and conditioner and the body wash so you look great and you smell great. You said it, Lepore. You want to look good and feel good when you're playing hockey. So you play good. Very important. All right, everybody, get 20% off and free shipping with the promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping using the promo code GFP20 at manscaped.com. Don't be a goon. Upgrade your hygiene routine with the ultra premium collection from Manscaped. And like, I'll ask you this though, Bruno, like Flurry's name came up and I, I thought like, no way, like it's not going to happen. He would be say the best goalie available. Could you see them taking a gamble on someone? Like say like a cheap alternative who has had a good year on a losing team? I think they're going to explore the goalie market. I really do, because I think they'd be crazy at this point not to. And again, I, I don't know if it's going to be Marc-Andre Fleury. I, I don't know if they're going to use the resources that they have, the capital that they have, the, the prospects that they have to go all in on Marc-Andre Fleury. And again, it's not like you have to go all in on Marc-Andre Fleury, but you're going to have mm. to give up something pretty significant for him. That's a loud move, Bruno. That's a loud move to get Marc-Andre Fleury. I don't, I don't see Fleury coming in, but I think they could explore, you know, like a B option. But then again, it's like, okay, if you're going to explore someone who's not a top-tier goalie, like a Marc-Andre Fleury, and I know you think otherwise. I know you're the number one Marc-Andre Fleury hater in the world. But it's like, if you're going to go that 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 other route and you're going to try to pick up some under the radar guy, some, you know, borderline starter guy, aren't you really in the same spot? Because you already have Peter Morazic, who is that essentially. And you could even argue Jack Campbell is that. If you pick up a guy who's hot, you're not in the same spot. Like being from Ottawa and seeing a lot of it, I'll point to Forsberg, Antoine Forsberg. He's had a great year. Like the guy's gone through waivers a million times. He's found a comfort zone. I'm not saying he completely solves the problem and he's going to bring you elite goaltending, but he's having a great year. What more do you want? Anton Forsberg has been playing very well for the Senators. And at the end of the day, what would you really have to trade to get him? So I don't know. I mean, it's complicated. It's complicated. I just think their main, their main priority and Dubas has said this is probably going after a defenseman and I and I know Dubas they has will. said that they're not looking to get a goalie but I think that's I think that's bullshit to be quite honest with you really like, I, I think he's just saying that because he's trying to instill confidence in Jack Campbell and Peter Morazic but if Dubas is as smart as I think he is do you really think 
he's watching this goaltending over the last few months. And you really think he's confident that this goaltending is going to get the Leafs through to the Stanley cup final, because at the end of the day, that's what this team is trying to do this year. And, you know, you could say, Oh, they're, they still haven't won a playoff series. This team is in Stanley cup win now mode. This team is not in, Oh, we're just going to win one playoff series. And then we're going to go golfing and all pat ourselves on the back. That's not what this team is in it for. This team wants to win a Stanley Cup. And if you're Kyle Dubas, there's no chance in hell you're sitting there saying, you know what? I have faith in Jack Campbell to bounce back. And this guy's going to lead us through four rounds of the playoffs against Florida and then Tampa and then whoever from the Metropolitan Division. And then we're going to beat Colorado in the Stanley Cup final with Jack Campbell, the way he's playing right now. I, I just can't. I can't imagine that he's comfortable thinking that right now. So yeah, maybe they do go after an Anton Forsberg who has had a really good season for the Ottawa senators and it shouldn't take as much to get him as it would a Mark Andre Fleury, but they got to pick up a defenseman as well because I don't want them to waste this season that's happening right now with Austin Matthews. They can't, they can't waste the season. What we've been watching the last little while. Yeah, it's going to be it's funny, the Leafs, right? You could write a book on the start of this year, how Campbell, how, how Campbell season commenced, how well he was playing, the numbers he was putting up, this downfall, and what will happen in the playoffs. And then we can move forward to his contract, and that's going to be very dependent on what happens in the playoffs, whether he gets a deal from the Leafs at all, or he gets a big deal or who knows. But at this point, my hands are completely up in the air. Like it went from the Leafs really want Jack Campbell, but won't be able to afford him to probably a good chance. Don't even try to sign him now. So I don't know, man. And again, it's, it's all going to matter on playoff performance, but as you touch on, who knows if we even get there, who knows if we even get there because not good man it's confidence and like i mean i wasn't really joking when i said it i think it was last show when i mentioned sports psychologists someone's got to talk to him and really someone who's professionally trained trained to get a sense of his confidence or his lack thereof and how he really and truly feels about the situation because if you don't have it in between the years and you're not confident and you're the goalie of the toronto maple leafs it's it's a you're spiraling out of control man you can't you, you can't hide you cannot hide and like the the word i used last podcast was terrified to describe this goaltending situation and right now i think almost because it's kept going like i'm not really terrified anymore i'm just like this is what i expect like i'm going into these games expecting a lot of goals and I just hope do I mean I hope do I really hope Dubas knows what he's doing either in the way he has confidence in a guy and things aren't going well right now or he's got the balls to make a move. That's it. I mean, I mean, is it possible the Leafs trade Jack Campbell? Yes, as part of a package to get to bring in a goalie. You'd have to. I mean, it, that would, has to be on the table, doesn't it? The, the salary. I mean, salary wise, they try Mrazek, but I mean that's ideal. But think, man, if a team's going to get, like we mentioned Forsberg, like right now, today, if a team was willing to take one of the, if they were willing to take Mrazek, you would do it. Oh, 100%. But, but if, if right now, if Ottawa said can't, can't, I mean, Campbell's not signed, but Forsberg for Campbell, I mean, would you do it? I mean, that's, you think that's about tough. It. Based on the way that both goalies have been playing this season, I'd rather have Anton Forsberg right now. Yeah, you think about it for sure. I'm just looking at his numbers. He's only played 27 games, but 921 save percentage, 269 goals against, playing behind a bad Ottawa Senators team. Does he not have a winning record? And his record, yes, is 12, 10, and 2. For the Sens. For the Ottawa Senators. A 921 save percentage for the Ottawa Senators. Think about that for a second. That could be a move yeah. right there. and. You're not the first person who I've seen bring up Anton Forsberg. I have seen his name floated around out there a little bit, but I, I'm very intrigued now that you brought it, 
you fully brought it to my attention on the GFP podcast. That yeah. could certainly be a name that the Leafs go after. But yeah, I mean, they, they really have to sort this out because like I, like I said, for the millionth time, there's no chance in hell this team is going to go on a playoff run with their goalies playing the way they are. Yeah. Before we got to talk about Austin Matthews. I was I was about to say, Bruno, let's move from negative to positive. You briefly touched on math, Matthews. Let's dive into that so we put ourselves in a better mood. What we're watching right now is unbelievable. Mm. I mean, there's really no other word to describe it. Every night, this guy is putting on an absolute show. And we know he's known for his goal scoring. He's on pace to score right around 60 goals. He leads the league with 43 goals. But what's so impressive this season is that he could win the Art Ross Trophy. Austin Matthews is now four points off the league lead in scoring behind Leon Dreisettle and Connor McDavid, who lead the league with 79 points. Austin Matthews is now up to 75 points. Not only is he producing a ton of points, not only is he going to win the Rocket Richard and flirt with 60 goals. This dude has been a monster defensively. He is up there on a lot of people's Selkie ballots right now. And when I say a lot of people, when you look at some of the advanced stats guys on Twitter and some of the other hockey writers and just people around hockey, he is getting a ton of buzz right now as a Selkie trophy candidate. This dude does it all. And right now he is the favorite, the betting favorite to win the Hart trophy at plus 175. This is amazing, Lepore. Like, they they can't possibly waste this season, can yeah. they, the Toronto Maple Leafs? No. No, this guy, what he's doing now, and I've said it on previous shows, he's the best goal scorer I've ever seen. He is the best goal scorer I've ever seen. And people are already saying, Ovechkin, exclamation point. And yeah, Ovechkin scored a lot of goals. But the reason why I say this, and I love Alexander Ovechkin, this is not an insult to him, when you're watching a highlight of the Capitals and they make sort of that uh, predict, like, how do, how do I put this? Like that segue to an Ovechkin goal. You're like, oh, there he is on the left taking that slap shot. A lot of his goals are the same. Austin Matthews scores every single possible way. He scores from the outside. He scores from the inside. We're seeing him on the power play this year. Slap shot, wrist shot, that DK made yesterday on that goal. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. And I actually think with Matthews, and this happens quite often in sports, I think because quite often a player is really good at one thing, people fail to notice the other aspects of their game that are very strong. Like in the case of Matthews, watch him in the offensive zone. His puck skill is bananas. When he's got that puck on his stick, you are not getting it. You are it's absolutely... The charts. And the way he's, it's like the way he almost just snaps it around. It has like almost like a suction cup to the guy he's passing it to. Almost like an NHL when you're playing a video game, how it just kind of goes directly right to that guy's stick. He's got that. We've talked about before about it, like the puck battles. He's always the guy who comes out with the puck. Two guys going to a corner, Matthew, stick lift, whatever it is, whether he goes in with the leverage or without, he's the guy who comes out with the puck. He's unbelievable, man. Like there was a talk on uh, tw- there's talk on Twitter the other day. Are we are we already at the point where he's the best Maple Leaf player of all time? I, mean, I think so. I mean, y- you can talk about like the Dave Keons of the world. If yeah, you like we Smythe. we weren't alive to watch Dave Keon in his prime, obviously, and mm-hmm. a lot of people will say Dave Keon. Like if I talk to my father. And other people from that generation, they'd all say Dave Keon, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe some guys would say Daryl Sittler. You know, I, I'm obviously a big fan of Matt Sundin, as are you. But no one has looked like number 34. No one. I mean, this dude is just, he's, he's on a tier all by himself, in my opinion. That's exactly it. He's on a different tier. And how, and how I would sum it up would be with Sittler, Sundin, Gilmore, those players, unbelievable players, world-class, unbelievable players, but none of them were ever the best goal scorer in the league and maybe the best player in the league. Like you, even Sundin, I mean, I'm the biggest Sundin fan in the world, but he was never the best player in the league, right? I just, man, it, it, it's fun to watch. It's awesome. It's awesome. The, the guys look great. And right now, the way things are going, 
think he's gonna I think he's gonna win everything man I, I think he's gonna win all those awards I made the point to someone the other day if you look at his closest competition it'd be McDavid and Dreisaitl if they miss the playoffs like there's kind of that old thing with the Hart Trophy that you can't win it if your team misses the playoffs that's a tough one yeah, they so, have no chance unless they go on a crazy streak where one of them is leading the league in scoring by 15 plus points, sort of like what we saw last season when McDavid had 105 points in 56 games. If mm. that team misses the playoffs, Lapore, no chance in hell one of those guys is winning the hard trophy. Yeah, especially if, if Matthews hits, a, hits that, I think he's on pace for like 65 right now. If he gets 60, he'll be the first guy since Stamkos through that, if I'm not mistaken. If he gets that number, like you said, he's and again, things people don't notice. He's only four points off the Art Ross. Crazy man, Un- unbelievable season. Remember that contract? Remember when that contract was signed? Everyone was flipping out at the number. I mean, we all wish there was more term, but it is what it is right now. I mean, I'm, looks like a pretty good contract. It looks like a pretty good freaking eleven point six million. Yeah, Austin Matthews, man. I love that point you brought up. How when someone is so good at one thing you almost fail to recognize the other things that that person is also really good at. And when it comes to Austin Matthews, I feel like people who don't follow the Leafs on a day-to-day basis, kind of like we do, or, you know, maybe casual hockey fans, they just look at Austin Matthews and they look at the stats and they say he has all these goals, but he doesn't have a lot of assists and and points. But This guy, even when it comes to his playmaking, I think he's an extremely underrated playmaker. And when you think about it, think about the guys that he's played with throughout his career. He has not played with great goal scorers. So you want to talk about, you know, Matthew's assist total not being as high as some of the other elite players in the league. It's because the guys that he's playing with can't score goals for the majority of his career, right? Off the start, he's playing with Connor Brown. Then he's playing with Zach Hyman. And for the people who talk about, you know, Mitch Marner being a huge reason why Matthews is what he is, Matthews didn't start playing a lot with Mitch Marner until last season. That's right. The first four years of Matthews' career, he sparingly played with Mitch Marner. He was playing most of the time, like I said, with Zach Hyman, with William Nylander. Connor Brown. Connor Brown, like these random dudes that he was just, that were being thrown on his wing. I'm not saying he's the playmaker that, McDavid or even dry is because I think both of those guys are excellent passers, excellent playmakers. And you know, he's not the playmaker that Mitch Marner is, but man, he makes some unreal plays. It's not just scoring goals. He can pass the puck. And now you're seeing Mitch Marner, his goal total is, is better than it has been throughout his career, right? He's probably going to score 30 goals this year for the first time. And now you're seeing Austin Matthews actually, Top five in the Art Ross race because the guys around him are actually scoring more goals. Same thing with Michael Bunting, who has 20 goals on the season and Let's who go. might be on the best contract in the NHL. So when you when all these things come together at once, it just shows you how good Austin Matthews can actually be. And, and you touched on it defensively. When that guy loses the puck in the offensive zone, just watch him because there's a pretty good chance that he's going to steal that puck right back. And the plays that he even makes in his own end, the defensive coverage, just the ability to stick on guys, the ability to take the puck away. I believe he still leads all forwards in takeaways this season. I mean, he's the complete package. And I think we really have to sit back and appreciate what we're watching right now because as of right now, he is the best player in the NHL. And you could say that Connor McDavid is still the best player in the world based on body of work, based on the last five to six seasons. But right now, March 9th, 2022, Austin Matthews is the best hockey player in the world. Yeah. Something I said to somebody the other day was, and it's kind of like one of those fun topics that we don't really know. And it's just kind of a guessing game. But if we were to make a list of all the best hockey players in the NHL, and then talk about the different sports. If it was football, baseball, basketball, golf. And we had to make guesses on which of those players would be very good at that sport, uh, at those sports. I think Matthews is near the top in every single one. Like I could just picture him being 
a really good baseball hitter. I could picture him being a really good golfer. He really was a good basketball. baseball player, Lepore. Sorry to That's cut right. you off. Yeah, that was his first sport. Growing right? up, like, that was his first sport. He was really good at it. And from what I remember, just kind of looking back at interviews and things that he's talked about when it comes to baseball is that he almost had to choose. Yeah. Was it going to be hockey or baseball when he was growing up? So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to say the guy could be a major leaguer, but continue on your point. I think he'd be great in pretty much any sport. And if you remember, it, I think it was all their rookie year, like Matthews, Marner, those guys, they did batting practice with the Blue Jays. And I remember seeing the footage of Matthews, like to your point of, oh, would he be a major leaguer? We don't know. I mean, how far he would have went in baseball. But I remember watching him doing batting practice, just that big body, like the elbows up, the form, how he was holding the bat. He looked like a Blue Jay. You could have, if I was 100 yards away, you could have told me he was a Blue Jay. But the point I'm making in all this, and make of it what you want, comment down below what you think. I think he very well may be the best athlete, like naturally gifted athlete in the National Hockey League. And the take I've always had on Matthews is he's our present day Mario Lemieux. Wayne Gretzky at the time and still is the most talented hockey player of all time. But Mario, Mario Lemieux, to me anyway, was the best physical talent. He had the hands, he had the reach, he had the size, he had the finish, everything, the strength, the power, name it, Lemieux had it. And to me, Matthews is a modern version of that. And that's the point I'm getting at, just in the way that he's that overall athlete. And I don't even, there's a lot of elite players in the league. And like, like I'll say it, not to make fun of him, like say Marner, of those sports I listed, which would we think he'd be very good at? I don't know. I can, almost can't picture him playing and being very good at anything. And I'm sure he is because, you know, the fast twitch muscle fibers and all that stuff. And people could point to this day. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm just making the point to me. I think Matthews is an incredible athlete overall. And that helps his game with, like we mentioned, the stick battles, like the coordination he has, like his release on his shot. Again, the best physical talent in the National Hockey League. Yeah, I, I don't think it's even a question. And again, I don't know how gifted – physically some other players are when it comes to playing other sports but you mentioned it man i i remember watching matthews take batting practice when, oh man when they had that all over tv and social media he was taking bp with the blue jays early and he looked career. like ken griffey jr <laughs> i'm pretty sure he hit a home run in batting practice and again oh, well there's been a lot of guys that have hit home runs in batting practice like Sidney crosby's hit a home run in batting know practice that. for the pittsburgh pirates sid hit a home run yeah, yeah. Sid, Sid's done it. There's, There's been other players as well. I'm pretty sure Stamkos is actually a pretty good baseball player as well. I'm sure we can I can dig see up, Stammer. Yeah, I can see I, Stammer. I think we can dig up well. some footage of, of, of Stamkos hitting a jack, taking BP with the Rays. But, yeah, I mean, Austin Matthews, this dude is, is unbelievable. And, you know, it's kind of weird to say that this is his coming out party because he's been so good over the first five years of his career. But it really does feel like like a coming out party for Austin Matthews because, like I said, it's almost like this perfect storm where not only is he probably going to score close to 60 goals, he's probably going to win the Hart Trophy. He might even win the Art Ross Trophy. Like He could potentially sweep every award. And, and one more stat to bring up when it comes to Matthews. Since November 1st, a span of 48 games. He leads the NHL with 42 goals and 73 points in the last 48 games. Absolutely outrageous. It's so we'll sad. see how the, the rest of the season plays out. Matthews only three to four weeks ago was plus 900 to win the Hart <sighs> Trophy. <sighs> and Lapore and I were, didn't, Jump on that for whatever reason, even though we talked about it on the Those podcast. Were idiots. <laughs> what a missed opportunity that was. But now he is a plus 175 favorite to win the Hart Trophy. So it's really not a great bet at the <laughs> moment, even though yeah. we can probably still make a little bit of money. But yeah, I mean, the way he's playing right now, it's between him and probably Igor Shosturkin, who's been unbelievable for the Rangers, having one of the greatest goaltending seasons really since Dominic Hasek or even that Carey Price season when he won the Hart Trophy in 2015. But Matthews has been absolutely insane. Is there anything yeah. else you want to get off your chest about the Toronto Maple Leafs, Lepore? Just, and you quickly touched on Marner 
but and like this this is kind of a take and another one comment down below what you think i think it's to the point now where and get ready for it everyone's going to explode i think mitch marner is underrated I think sometimes as a fan base, we watch our team every game, game in, game out. And there are guys who do certain things so often that we almost kind of take them for granted. Matthews, or Matthews, Marner makes incredible plays every game. His creativity and patience are off the chain. That goal he scored last night was bonkers. Like that fake quick shot. Are people even talking about it today? It was insane. Not really. Like, it's just, oh, yeah, nice goal, whatever. Put the Leafs in a good spot. And that spot. was the game winner. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And that, that's, that's a wrap on it. Because I think he's so good at those things that we almost kind of miss them and don't pay as much attention as we should to these individual moments. How many times did he set up bunting in Matthews last night? There was a one Matthews miss. We had the open net. Like, when does that happen? There's another one bunting. He made a great move, cut it to the left, and bunting just couldn't finish. You mentioned the points Matthews put up. Over the last, uh, was like 35 games. I'd like to see those numbers on Marner because he had that slow start. I know last time I checked, he had creeped in a top 15 in scoring, but he's looked great, man. And people are going to, I can already hear people's reactions. Well, what about the playoffs and this and that? Yeah, that's right. And he's got to show us in the playoffs. But again, like what we touched on Matthew's contract. If you watch Mitch Marner and you really and truly pay attention to what he brings and what he provides, I think it's tough to argue that that's a shit contract. I mean, it's not an ideal contract, but I think it's tough to argue that like, oh man, I wish the Leafs could dump that. And there will, there will be takes based on how this team does in the playoffs. But as it stands now and, and looking at this season, the guy's an incredible player. And I really do think we're at the point where he's underrated and underappreciated by Leafs fans. Well, I'll put it this way. This is kind of how I see Marner. We talk about how maybe Matthews is the greatest Maple Leafs player of all time if we didn't have Matthews and Marner was kind of the centerpiece he's on the list the guy was a first team all-star last year and you can say it's a bad thing I mean talking about the history of the Toronto Maple Leafs but how many times has a Maple Leaf player been a first time a first team all-star not many and like putting up the points he's putting up and the consistency he's up there man so again maybe that's that's the other reason too because Austin Matthews exists Marner doesn't get the attention he deserves but incredible player, man, incredible player. And I hope he's motivated for the playoffs because I don't want him to have to go through another summer like he did last year. No, it's actually funny how Marner kind of flies under the radar because he's the guy who's led the Leafs in scoring there pretty much every year of his career, I believe, except for maybe one season. And I talked about those stats with Austin Matthews Lepore over his last 48 games since November the 1st how he leads the league with 42 goals and 73 points. So Matthews, since November 1st, is number one in the league in points per game. Who do you think is number two in points per game in the NHL? Is it Mitch Marner, Anthony? Mitch Bernie? Marner, 59 points in 39 games since the beginning of November. Second in the league in points per game behind Austin Matthews. Wow, that's, about that. that's great. That's like, what, a point and a half pace? Point like and a half a game. So wow, if you look at the list, days. it's Matthews number one. Again, this is since November the 1st. So it's, you know, two, three weeks into the season. So you have Matthews yeah. number one, Marner number two, Kucherov's number three. He's only played 18 games though. Yeah. Kirill Kaprizov is number four. Nazem Kadri number five. Jonathan Huberto number six. Connor McDavid, number 12. Oh, him? And Leon Dreisaitl, <laughs> number nine on that list points per game since the beginning of November. And you like to bring this up on, on you've brought this up on several podcasts. Oh no, where are you going with five this? on five scoring oh, before here we, go. here we go with McDavid and dry settle. I got this pulled up right now. Okay. So oh, God. five, on five. get ready. Five Oilers on fans. It's actually, it's actually hilarious. <laughs> Bruno's Bruno's already laughing. Get ready. Oilers fans. You know where he's going with this one. Five on five points this season, okay? Yeah. Who do you think is number one? I'll tell you right now, it's not a leaf. Five on five? Five on five points this year. Is it kind of like a random one, semi-random one? Uh, not really. He's had a really good season. I was going to say Kadri was going to be my guess. He, he's right up there, but number one is Johnny Gaudreau. 
Oh, okay. So Johnny cool. Gaudreau leads nice. the league in five on five points. Austin Matthews is second. Kaprizov is third. Kadri is fourth. Michael Bunting is fifth in the National Hockey League <laughs> this season go. in five on five points. Does our audience want to know where Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid rank in five on five points this season? Let's hear it, Anthony. Bruno, if I said no, would you not? Would you not say it? So let's let's hear it, brother. Oh, you know I'm bringing the heat right now. Leon Dreisaitl, twelfth in the NHL in five on five points. But it gets even better, Lapore. Oh, I Connor thought it was going to be worse than that. Eighteenth in the NHL oh, okay. in five on five points this year. He is behind Andre Burakovsky. Well, I shouldn't say behind. They're tied in five-on-five five points. 35 five-on-five five points. Andre Burakovsky, Connor McDavid. Actually, there's like a five-way tie here. Jesper Bratt on the Devils. Kale wow. McCarr has as many five-on-five five points as Connor McDavid. Wow. So even though Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl still lead the league in scoring 79 points apiece, you got to take a look at these stats here because when these dudes are sitting 12th and 18th respectively in five on five scoring, there's no way you can say Austin Matthews is not the best player in the world right now. You just can't. Bum, bum, bum. So yeah, it's uh, it's kind of, it's funny to look at that, that Michael Bunting has five more five on five points than Leon Dreisaitl and seven more five on five points than Connor McDavid. Yeah. They were talking about it on the Steve Dangle podcast. I don't know if it was Dom LeCision or Jay Fresh, one of those guys, one of his metrics to measure defensive play and get revved up Oilers fans. If you didn't hear this already, he had, I forget if it was McDavid, if it was McDavid dry or dry McDavid, but they were the two worst players in the league defensively based on what, whatever, whatever algorithm. And wow. I mean, yeah, like to be very bottom, I mean, make of that what you want. I don't know where the metric lies and what it gathers, but it's, it's something. Like it, it's definitely something. One thing that was crazy was that it was, I think everyone knows Shifley is shit defensively uh, and Connor, but even like Blake Wheeler, like everyone talks about the Jets and their problems. If you remember correctly on that podcast, they mentioned that all three are like in the top based on this metric were three of the worst, like 10, like in the national hockey league, all playing for the same team on the same line for that matter. So yeah, that's concerning. Uh, yeah. Like, come on. I, yeah. I know that the, uh, that chart that you're referring to, I think it was a J fresh mm. stats chart showing those three Winnipeg jets guys in the bottom 10 defensively among, I believe it was among forwards. Yeah. You know, I, I, wonder, I still, I, Go I was going to say, I still kind of have a, to me, it's, I, I still think it's difficult to track just how good certain players are defensively. Mm -hmm. It's just way easier to track how good someone is offensively and how much they yeah. contribute on that side of the ice. I still think, and again, maybe some of the advanced stats guys in the community would completely disagree with me on this, but I still think we're a few years away from actually tracking this accurately and i'm not saying it's not accurate but i just think it's a hell of a lot easier to say that you know austin matthews or Connor mcdavid contribute this much offensively contribute this much to scoring this many goals i think it's harder to kind of quantify how good especially a forward is on the defensive side of the puck and again maybe the advanced stats community is going to call me a complete idiot but i still think we're a few years away from like totally defining how good someone is defensively based on the data. Yeah. I think at the end of the day too, it's impossible to separate the individual from their team. Like we mentioned Shifley, Wheeler and Connor. It's hundred percent. I mean, hundred percent. I would assume that it's one of those things where the three of them aren't strong defensively from an individual standpoint. So then you put them all together and because they're all bad, it kind of brings them all down to an even worse level. And in the case of McDavid and Dreisaitl, at the end of the day, to me, it's about kind of like overall totality of what you bring to the ice. So whatever metric they use, however they did it, like, for example, if they said, okay, McDavid and Dreisaitl give up the most scoring chances when they're on the ice. Okay, but how many scoring chances are they also creating when they're on the ice? 
So like it, you say, oh, they're giving away 10, but if they're creating 15, well, they're plus five. It doesn't matter. It's, it's, the, it's the overall number. So it was just kind of, I mean, I'm sure Jay Fresh loved to put that out because I'm sure it caused a lot of discussion, tweets, retweets, banter, people screaming and yelling. But I think, and I would say the same thing offensively. Someone might say, oh, so-and-so never produces anything offensively or very little, but then, okay, but if you look defensively, he doesn't give up a lot either. So he's still in the plus, he's still in the green, which is what really matters. So I'm with you that like these numbers, like make of them what you want. And they haven't really perfected the, the best ways to interpret defensive play or to calculate defensive play. But I'm simple, man. I look for the numbers, which players have the puck the most. Defensive zone entries, where the puck is on the ice when those guys are on the ice scoring chances when those guys are on the ice because to me those are the big ones that don't lie like i made i, I made the comment about mcdavid and anyone who thinks we're shitting on mcdavid the guy's incredible when he's on the ice the oilers have the puck for the most part and the puck is in the offensive end and I remember being an ottawa guy it was kind of like the new age stuff of the advanced stats but when carlson was coming up in the league as this defense been putting up all these all these points people would make the uh what would point to how bad he was in his own end because he was never very good in his own end in front of the net and i remember the point i I would always bring up is that here you have this guy who's supposed to win the norris trophy but when his team was up by one with a minute to go he's not on the ice because he's a defensive liability but from the overall standpoint and again this is kind of at least at the early days or early ish days of advanced stats being like a normal thing some hockey people pointed to me they were like yeah but when he's on the ice, the Sens always have the puck and it's in the offensive end and the other team can't score when the puck's in the offensive end. So to me, those are the numbers that really jump out and I really pay the most attention to. Yeah. I still think there's a lot of gray area. I do agree with you. Like if you look at, you know, the shot attempts when someone's on the ice at five on five, the scoring chances, the high danger scoring chances, like Austin Matthews rates very high in all of those categories. And oh, it's, yeah, he's it, like the best at all. And it's either. higher than Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisettle. It just is. You can go check natural stat trick, you know, any of these advanced stats website websites, right? But in baseball, for example, right? Like there's so many stats. It's like, it's black or white, right? It's like this player goes up to bat 10 times and he gets on base four times out of 10. He gets a hit three times out of 10. Obviously, I can get crazy nerdy about baseball if I wanted to. I'm trying to really simplify it, right? There's only like a certain amount of outcomes that could happen. It's a one-on-one battle, the batter versus the pitcher. Whereas in in hockey, you know, it depends on your line mates. It depends on the goaltending. It depends on the system your, your coach has in place, right? Like there's so many different factors. So you can't really say that so-and-so is a terrible defensively, but how about if they had a chance to play with you know, I don't know, Patrice Bergeron exactly. or Austin Matthews, for example, yeah. then all of a sudden their defensive and offensive numbers go up, right? So I still think there's kind of a gray area when it comes to that. But as of right now, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, based on all the metrics, based on everything that's that we've seen over the first 50 to 60 games here, Austin Matthews has been the most dominant player in the NHL. And Oilers fans, you can yell at us all you want about McDavid and Dreisaitl, but when they both rank 12th and 18th in five-on-five points, I mean, really? Andre Burakovsky has the same amount of five-on-five points. There we go. Bruno, there's a screwdriver, just Bruno going right in there. Jesper Bratt, Jesper Bratt, however he pronounces his name, has the same amount of five-on-five points this season as Connor McDavid. And you're going to tell me that that player right now is the best player on the planet. I'm sorry. I love Connor McDavid body of work. You could say he's the best player in the world. And I probably still would say he's the best player in the world based on body of work. But 2022 is the year of number 34 on the Toronto Maple Leafs. Plain and we, should simple. Be, we should be careful, Bruno. People are going to point to these comments we're making when McDavid signs with the Leafs as a free agent. Oh man. Remember when you guys <laughs> said he wasn't that good. <laughs> Oh, God. You know what? Um, we like to joke around about it. People in hockey love to joke around about it. But there is yeah. actually a real possibility that that happens. And I know Oilers fans uh, don't want to hear it. And I know they're going to yell at us in the comments. But we'll, we'll just wait. We're going to patiently wait, Lapore, 
to see how that situation plays out in Edmonton. Mm. And we didn't even get into the Oilers in this podcast because we've ran out of time here. But Well, we kind of did. We, you kind of shot on their two best players for a while. Well, just in terms of where they are right now, they're out of the playoff picture at the moment. The Edmonton oh. Oilers are currently three points out of a wild card spot through 57 games. In a shit Pacific division. In a shit Pacific division. You know, it's hilarious how people would say, you know, Matthews put up all his points because of the shitty Canadian division and now the Atlantic division, like the I've bottom seen that leaders, take. like Montreal and, and Buffalo, they all suck. Look at what fucking McDavid is playing against <laughs> in the Pacific division. That division yeah, is a Tam- piece of shit. And Tampa, Florida, Florida, and Boston and the Metro were all shit. I've seen that take. Give me a fucking break. Oh my God. It drives me insane. Oh my, like, I'm just like looking at some of the comments that I've seen when it, when it comes to that, it's just like, you know, everyone praised McDavid like 105 points in 56 games. And then everyone shits on Matthews for doing what he did against the Canadian division. And now this season, apparently Matthews is at an absolute cakewalk while mm-hmm. McDavid is playing against these shitty Pacific division teams. They're not even in a playoff spot in the worst division in hockey, Lapore, the Edmonton mm-hmm. Oilers. Mm-hmm. It's, it's unbelievable. Anyway, I mean, we can go on and on, but Lapore, before we wrap this thing up, is there anything else you want to get off your chest? No, but Bruno, hopefully the next show we can talk about something other than pucks just sailing into our net more than we'd like. I mean, we're happy to be winning most of them, but God, as a podcast host, I would like to talk about something else. Amen, Lapore, please. For the love of God, Jack Campbell and Peter Morazic, figure it out because I don't want to go another podcast talking about how terrible the Leafs goaltending is. It would just be lovely to talk about something else, but we'll see what happens over the next week leading up to episode 55 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast. And uh, just a heads up, looking at the Leafs schedule, they play the Coyotes at home on Thursday night. And uh, I don't really feel too confident about that. Haven't they scored? Haven't sounds. they scored like 17 goals in two games or something? The Coyotes. Well, before Nick Schmaltz on the Coyotes has yeah. 21 points in his last 10 games. Yeah, because he had what seven against Ottawa had, or something. Yeah, seven against yeah. Ottawa. He had four last night. They've been putting the puck in the net. Clayton Keller has been really good recently. Like that. Richie team... scored last night. Oh man. Yeah. See, they... Let's. So seriously, though, like, does Richie get, like, the standing ovation? Does he get, like, the Jumbotron oh. ceremony of his time in Toronto? Like, what, what do we do for, uh, for Nick Richie? Do the Leafs just act like it never happened? <laughs> oh, God. Uh-huh. He just we, didn't give Ke- and- we didn't give Kessel one, so. <laughs> the broadcast doesn't even acknowledge no. Nick Richie. No. Like, the, the, the PA announcer doesn't say anything. We, we just kind of all forget that Nick Ritchie was ever a Toronto Maple Leaf as terrible as that sounds you know what he should do if I was him have fun with it do like the wave that would be awesome like awesome good for Nick right but, yeah I mean I'm I'm happy that Nick Ritchie is is out of this fishbowl like I'm sure he's actually enjoying himself a lot more like you said he scored he's in sunshine last night. he's in sunshine there's no pressure he's gonna be in that cool environment playing at Arizona State why not man? yeah so we're we're rooting for Nick Ritchie yeah, let's go, Nick. But that is going to do it, everybody, for episode 54 of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs at NHL podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. Once again, if you're a new listener and you enjoyed the show, it would be a big-time help if you give us a five-star rating and review on Apple. And if you're watching us on YouTube, we would appreciate it so, so much if you smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell so you know exactly when the GFP podcast is posting some new content. So for Michael Lapore, I'm Anthony Bruno, and we will see you in the next one. Thanks, everyone.